Uh, thank you so much all for coming this evening. So um, some of you might have seen this performance, some of you might not have seen this performance and uh, luckily for you I'm going to start with the PR here. If you haven't seen this show that I'm going to talk about the process of what the research was about, how we made the show, you can see this show because it is going on tour this autumn uh, again um, and it will be on tour from the end of October all over national tour finishing at the Soho Theatre here in London from the 19th of November to the beginning of December so you can catch it again and it opens at the Attenborough Centre in Brighton. Uh, but so I'm not going to do the show tonight but I'm going to talk about the show which has elements of what we do in the show but in the show we you know saw a woman in half and we a woman hangs from her hair and we get covered in lots of blood and I will not be doing that tonight. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so, um, I, as Chris said, uh, came to the lectures of the Radical Anthropology Group in the early 90s. And um, at the time, I was uh, making a show with a group of performers. We were a collective called the Dragon Ladies. And we were really interested in the idea of uh, the decorated woman in fairy tale and myth and the sexualized woman in fairy tale and myth and I came really in a way to research those topics and I came and I found out these extraordinary mind-blowing ideas about menstruation and the origins of culture and this stayed in my mind all those years uh, at the time we had this this company called the Dragon Ladies and we took over what was then the Raymond Review Bar which was a striptease venue uh, which then later became called The Box, which in a way is still a striptease venue, just for sillier, richer people. Um, <laughs> they were silly and rich then, and they're still silly and rich, but apparently it's trendy now, whereas at the, before it was just the sex industry. But um, we took it over with a kind of feminist agenda, and we retold, we were really influenced by Angela Carter and Marina Warner, and we retold fairy tales from a kind of feminist perspective. and. Um, and that was the research I was doing and then I remembered uh, as the years went by um, about this research into menstruation. So I did other projects, I, I built a ghost ride which was the biggest uh, project that I did with, with a group of amazing performers and artists and artisans and we, um, I'm just going to do this as a backstory because I haven't got slides of this tonight, but we, uh, we had this ghost train, we did it at Glastonbury, we did it in Brick Lane, and it was all of images of disappeared women between borders. Um, and it was an, a real ride that you rode around in cars. Um, and so I guess f for, for me and, and my work, to put this into context, I've always been interested in cultural and social issues um, and how that can combine with popular performance tropes. So I'm aware this is an anthropology group as opposed to a theatre department, um, but f for me I don't make theatre about theatre or performance about performance. I make theatre and performance about things that I find really fascinating like uh, cultural theory, mythology and anthropology. So. Um, this is what happened. I came to the Radical Anthropology Group, I was really inspired by it and for myself and lots of the women uh, around me in my community we were all having our own battles and struggles with if we were going to have children, if we were trying to have children and menstruation and our bodily cycles seemed to be something that we were all talking about very much. People were struggling to conceive or they were having IVF or they definitely didn't want kids or they were having miscarriages and everybody was quite fixated on their bodily cycles including me and I thought how am I going to kind of navigate this uh, this territory of, of of how to be at peace with this uh, this decision I have to make or this struggle around my own fertility and my own bodily cycles. So rather than going to uh, Harley Street and paying lots of money for uh, what do they call it? A quack, a quacky doctor or buying lots of books on self-help, I thought I know how I'm going to explore my fertility and my relationship to my fertility. I'm going to study anthropology at the Radical Anthropology Group and I'm going to understand 
what my bodily cycle means in the context of politics, in the context of world culture, uh, uh, and in the politics of now, and in mythology, uh, and in traditional human cultures. What does the body cycle mean? And what I discovered through this journey, of course, was so much greater than, than what I could ever have imagined, what I just touched on in the 90s. So what we did was, I brought together a group of performers, um, an intersectional group of performers from all different backgrounds uh, with all different skills. Um, and we'll learn more about that later. And looking at the ideas that groups of menstruating women that I found out from my uh, studies in, in, uh, in anthropology uh, and, and from ideas from, from Chris's work and the work that I was researching around that, the groups of menstruating women could, we could suggest, are the origins of communal action and, and strike. Now, I'd always been very influenced by uh, communal action. I'd always been interested in, in being an activist. And uh, this is, I'm not in this picture, obviously, but I think this is a picture from the Green and Common Women's Camp. Some of who, people in this room may have been involved in that, I'm aware. Um, but I was involved uh, as a young woman in the anti-McDonald's campaign. That was my introduction to activism. And the first performance that I ever did publicly, uh, my friends and I dressed up as hamburgers and <laughs> We, we got on stage and then we had lots of blood. It was always about blood with me. We were scrubbing ourselves. And if anybody remembers this performance, it was the An Anarchist Book Fair in Conway Hall. I think it was 1993 or four. And we were scrubbing ourselves. And then we had this big piece of paper that says, that's the difference at McDonald's you'll enjoy. And, you know, that was... <laughs> so I was always interested in where we intersect uh, activism, uh, cultural politics and identity and stories um, and, and performance. And of course, any uh, action and any group I is a performance. It's performative and it's performative language. And I've always been really inspired by this image, which again, I think is of some of the green and women activists who created webs um, that they laid under so that they couldn't be removed. You, and perhaps Camilla can, can interject here and knows about this image but I found this image really extraordinary so it was really hard to remove these incredible women activists because they were under a web that they created like a spider which of course is is so performative and so extraordinary um, when I was researching this show and how we were going to make this into a performance I was also thinking about groups like the radical cheerleaders all over North America. I don't know if there are any groups in the UK. I know they have one cheer called the Menstrual Cheer, which is actually featured in Chris Bobel's book, Menstruation, um, Third Wave Feminism, Menstruation, and I can't remember the name of it, but the author is Chris Bobel. And it's all about third wave feminism and menstrual activism versus menstrual spiritualism. Which is, which is what we really wanted to explore in the show, is we were really interested in the idea of the red tent, but we were concerned that those ideas were on some level, had a bit of an essentialist idea about what woman is. Because of course, in our group, uh, which you'll find out about in a minute, we weren't, all the way, we weren't all the same kind of women. We were all different kinds of women. Not all of us menstruated, not all of us had a womb, and some of us didn't even actually identify with the word woman and were using the pronoun they. So I guess, um, I don't know where I was going with that, but uh, there, there are the uh, menstrual cheerleaders, and we would call them menstrual activists. So they would be campaigning, uh, around things about tampon tax, around the taboo of menstruation, but they're very much activists. They're on the street doing performance activism, being activists, singing chants. But of course, there are menstrual spiritualists, if we look at menstrual activity in feminism today. Um, these also are menstrual activists, kind of art house menstrual activists from Spain, La Sangre Menstrual, and they did lots of walking on marches with menstrual stained underwear. Um, but the menstrual spiritualists, I guess, what, are what we would call the, the, the red tent movement, which is a huge movement, uh, mainly kind of coming out of America, but it's across the Western world. And this would be to kind of reclaim on some level an idea that, that women come together when they menstruate, and this would be in a, in a private and a closed uh, context. 
uh, where, where men or, the, or somebody identified as a man would be excluded from, from this group. And it would be a safe space to talk about menstruation. Um, so some of the criticisms of, I guess, the red tent movement, and, and I'm sure there may well be people who are part of the red tent movement in the room tonight, and hopefully this will serve for an exciting debate after this talk, um, would be that there is on some level a, a, um, a decision about who gets to come into the red tent or not, about what constitutes the, the, the title woman. Um, and, you know, um, and, and so, so there is a possibly a, a kind of a tension between the idea of menstrual activism and menstrual spiritualism. And there is obviously a difference in, in the reason these two things exist in the culture. So what we were excited to do with the show is see if we could put these two things together. And um, through the medium of avant-garde cabaret. And we wanted to play with a lot of other things too. But um, going back to some of the kind of performative images and the kind of performative protest movements that we were really excited by, uh, as you saw that image of us in the Red Sea, would be the kind of performative actions of, say, the women in black movement, that um, women coming together um, in Bosnia, um, women coming together, Israeli and Palestinian women coming together to protest for peace, and looking at some of the imagery around the women in black movement around the world, uh, images of mourning mothers, uh, images of women working together in process, protest, images of the collective. Okay, I'm gonna skip from that to something completely different that influenced the show, and that is the soaring in half illusion. Now, um, I've always been obsessed with, with the soaring the woman in half, and I, and I don't know why, but since I was a little girl, I was really excited about the idea of, of cutting a woman in half and her being in two parts and then her coming back to life. Perhaps this is a sick obsession. And as you can see in this early rendition of the, of the piece, this is a husband having his, his wife sawn in half before they get married uh, from the 50s. <laughs> so um, what's really exciting about the, the, the soaring in half illusion uh, and its relationship to the, the suffragette movement is when P.T. Selbit uh, premiered this, uh, this illusion in the 1920s uh, at the Finsbury Park Empire. He invited um, Emmeline Pankhurst to, to be his assistant and there was a direct kind of uh, publicity stunt of, of challenging the suffragette movement uh, that they needed to be sawn in half and, and controlled um, by the magicians of the day. So you could say that the soaring in half uh, illusion was um, a reaction to feminism and the rise of feminism and it was uh, the magic community uh, or the magic community as led by male stage magicians um, reacting to the idea of women fighting as activists for their rights with this extremely violent image. But uh, I'm going to take you on a journey that leads us to understand through my research with the Radical Anthropology Group that this image is indeed a menstrual image. And I'm going to tell you how. Um, <laughs> and little do these magicians know that. That's the biggest and most exciting secret that they don't know. This one's a bit pixelated, sorry about that. But th what's interesting about this one is that the early, early soaring in half, you couldn't see the woman. She was absolutely in this wooden box. She was completely hidden. Here's one that you can see a bit better. Now, she to me looks like she's menstruating. I don't know if you agree, but <laughs> she's not having a good time. And, and, and he is absolutely controlling her, uh, her flow there, for sure. Um, he's deciding when she is apart and when she is back together. So he seems to have taken control of this woman's body. Um, so this obviously was to, uh, because we're talking about the relationship between the suffragette movement and the soaring in half illusion. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you on a bit of a romp through my research in an interesting order because the show is an interesting mixture of of things, but we'll, we'll all come together at the end. So this is Judy Chicago's menstrual bathroom. It's one of the kind of uh, well-known menstrual artworks of the 20th century. And this was part of the woman house uh, movement in California. 
and I don't know if you, anyone knows about the woman house in Judy Chicago but they had these houses uh, which they opened as installations and the menstrual bathroom was was kind of a famous one and it had bins full of bloodied menstrual products and it was really and it had a woman coming out of a cupboard I don't have that slide but it was uh, in the 60s and it was really talking about this hidden thing that is made clinical that is made about hygiene and obviously what we're talking about uh, is really looking at why uh, our, our menstrual cycle uh, has been made into a, a hygiene issue and, and really if it's not a hygiene issue what is it? Is it in fact the magic that those male magicians are trying very hard to control? <laughs> Carrie might agree with me and Stephen King's research uh, might uh, agree with this and I'm sure Stephen King has probably read uh, Chris Knight's book uh, before he wrote Carrie I would suggest um, <laughs> and looks at the idea that the menstruating woman on some level has paranormal powers and on some level is the figure of the witch so we're looking at the relationship uh, historically or historically I guess um, of the idea that menstruation has this this uh, forbidden power has this occult power and is connected somehow psychologically in our mind to the idea of witches to the idea of a group of women secluded on their own having more power than normal so menstruation witches our obsession with women covered in blood in horror films so another thing that I've always loved as well as images of women being cut in half uh, I, you know, I, I'm really excited and moved by this image uh, from uh, Dario Gento's classic art house horror film, Suspiria. And of course, this poor ballet student has been cruelly hung in this extremely beautiful art deco hallway. <laughs> and wh why am I obsessed with, this, with these images? Why do I like movies where, where really trashy, misogynist, horrible movies like Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Suspiria? Um, well, I think there is a primal reason why we keep covering women in blood and cutting them in half, and I don't think it's because we want to kill them. I think it's because there's something very uh, moving and unconscious about seeing a woman covered in blood, and I think it's menstrual, might, might we suggest. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a very stylish image. I saw this film, and this film, which was dubbed as a video nasty in the 80s, Andrei Zulowski's possession, Isabella Agiani on the Berlin subway having this really extreme miscarriage. She later goes on to have sex with a giant octopus sperm monster. But before that happens, she, she well, no, I think she has sex with the giant sperm monster and then she has the miscarriage. Uh, <laughs> probably uh, influencing Alien there somewhat um, but I found this image really moving and I found this re image really moving because having been through a miscarriage I had never seen a representation of a miscarriage in the culture let alone a representation of menstruation you just don't see it and the only place I could find it was in this really bizarre 1980s film and often where menstruation and miscarriage find themselves in cultural representation in our culture is in horror for some reason. Back to our fairy tales, back to our mythology, back to the witch. And in this scene she gets into a hysteria and her movement is almost like a kind of Pina Bausch type choreography and there's lots of tricks in her dress. So whoever created this scene they rigged up lots of blood into the dress and in the film she's wearing a blue high collared dress and the dress keeps changing with her moods through the film and sometimes it's a paler blue sometimes it's a darker blue and this dress and this image influenced my idea for a, for a performance for the performance for my costume in the performance but um, there was something so cathartic in its representation I think because it's the horror genre so say I know now we have things like uh, Call the Midwife and there are representations now, but that's a really recent series um, where women's issues are represented, which I guess is why that's a good series on, on a level. But um, then I was finding it very, the, you know, the representations that I found moving or that I could connect to that gave me some catharsis were, were coming out of these supernatural representations like Possession, like Carrie. 
Now I'm gonna, I was gonna show you this little film of me having a bloodbath that appears in the film, uh, but I might skip to that and come back to it in a minute uh, because it's a bit, it's a bit hardcore. There you go. Uh, so here are some of the menstruants. So what we did was, mm, I gathered together these women, really exciting, extraordinary women who I'm going to tell you about in a second. And we got together following the idea that if women came together on the dark of the moon, as was from the um, anthropological research I'd done through this group, not the full of the moon, which some of the red tent movement would suggest. So there's a, everybody goes, oh, you're synchronizing. It's because it's a full moon. And this idea that the full of the moon and the woman's womb are connected, that when the moon is full, your womb is full. Well, what we discovered from the research through Radical Anthropology Group and through all the books that I was reading around that was that in traditional human culture, uh, it's the dark of the moon when women menstruate. The moon is dark, your womb is dark. <laughs> The moon is full, you're ovulating, you're having sex, that's the time to go out and party. And I'm not trying to reiterate your research, but just in case there are people that don't know about your research, I'm filling them in. Um, so if you want to hear more about that, come to another night at the Radical Anthropology Group. So uh, in a way, kind of taking the mickey out of that because we're cabaret artists and we're not living in traditional human cultures. We all live in England um, and we all live in towns and cities. Um, instead of us kind of appropriating or reinventing um, traditional human cultural rituals around menstruation from cultures that we may have had a heritage connection to, so th th everybody had a, a different heritage in the group, but instead of appropriating those rituals from our heritages, we were inspired by them, um, we decided to reinvent our own menstrual rituals. So we met every weekend, every dark moon in a house in South End. It's an artist residency house uh, called Metal that let us meet there. And uh, we went into silence and then we reinvented menstrual rituals. But we did them as a kind of form of activism. So instead of doing our menstrual rituals that we were inventing, and I took the artists through a series of exercises that were informed from theatre practices, they were informed from um, gathering data about people's menstrual profile, from reading around psychology studies around menstruation. They were informed by reading about traditional human cultural rituals, reading about religious human cultural rituals around menstruation, and they were informed by our stories, our memories, our experiences. So we came up with these performative actions and we did them out in the landscape in South End instead of inside like the red tent. So people that were walking past would think, you know, crazy feminists doing crazy stuff. Um, but in a way we were inserting ourselves into the landscape and creating ritual in the landscape, which I guess was our attempt to fuse this idea of menstrual activism and menstrual spiritualism. But we were doing it in a tacky seaside town with stuff, some costumes from joke shops. So it, it had a kind of realness to it and it had, and it meant a lot to us, but we were also making performance and, and playing, playing with it at the same time to be discussed later. So, um, you know, our relationship of this connection, you know, going back, the imagery of women and the moon and this idea of femininity, we wanted to play with those things. You know, the idea that the moon is a time for reflection or that there's a gentleness about women in the moon, the idea that a woman and her connection to the moon is ferocious or, or violent or murderous, that it is monstrous and beastly, that her sexuality is, is demonic, um, that she has the power of cyclicity and she hangs between life and death. Looking at all these images uh, across world cultures and going, are these images menstrual? Is there anything menstrual about these images that we're looking at? Because they're all cyclical and they're all bloody and they're all about life and death. Guess what? <laughs> What's that about? You know, is it about women killing men or men about killing women? Or is it <laughs> about the cyclical nature of our bodies? So um, 
do women synchronize? That was kind of what we wanted to play with. So we'd heard about the study of uh, Dr. Martha McClintock, the psychologist, the kind of legendary study where uh, the women who were all um, lifeguards living in a college, I think it's in the 70s, that were uh, in, in uh, Wellesley College in the States and she measured them and they started to synchronize but her research was disputed and it's still not been proven that women synchronize and when I would say to people oh I want to do like a synchronicity study people would go oh don't do that don't do a synchronicity study so you know obviously I'm from the theatre department and uh, you know m my degree will be in wearing silly hats and you know funny makeup as opposed to uh, any, anything scientific. So the idea was that the show would in a way play with the tropes and the ideas of synchronicity but it wouldn't be a scientifically grounded research study of whether women menstrually synchronize but we would try to prove on some level whether they did through the power of cabaret. And guess what? We did! <laughs> um, so here's another image I found, which we use in the show to talk about menstrual synchronicity, um, and that always gets a laugh. So um, here are the participants. Um, now Nagai is a member of the Frank Chickens that you might know, which is a well-known Japanese avant-garde pop group, but you can see them at places like Cafe Otto. Um, Fancy Chance is one of the only female hair hangers in the world. Uh, she was a star of the recent season of La Soiree and she also has her own show um, about being um, uh, adopted from um, being born in Korea and adopted by an American family. It's a really, really interesting show called The Flights of Fancy which is on tour at the moment and plays at Soho Theatre regularly. I recommend you see it. Uh, this is H. Pluis, who is a live artist that's worked with avant-garde troupe Ducky. She trained as a, a choreographer. This is Rhiannon Stiles, who is Elle's first trans columnist. Her book, The New Girl, is out now in bookshops. And she is a trans activist. And controversially, perhaps, we asked her to join our troupe of menstruators. We'll talk more about that in a minute. And this is Mr. Blue, one of the only female sword swallowers in the world and uh, she is now living in Germany sword swallowing in German cabaret she also recently did a TED talk uh, about her life which you can find online so we made this uh, show by meeting every month for quite a few months and on the dark moon making up these ideas of what rituals would be and uh, we ended up making this show, which takes the form, much as I am today, of, of a lecture with slides. But I play a character that is a bit like a crazy anthropologist. No disrespect to anthropologists in the room. Um, <laughs> and I come on very prim in a little bit like the blue dress that Isabella Aggiani wears in possession. But my dress, instead of having lots of live blood uh, spurting it transforms and becomes a kind of a showwoman evening dress and then one of the controversial things we do I'm not going to show you a full frontal of it this evening is uh, later in the show we Rhiannon comes on not already sawn in half she comes on into halves and uh, rather than uh, sawing her in half we, we put her back together again and we we make a woman uh, in a kind of Frankenstein way, women make this our trans woman into a woman. Uh, this is one of the big acts in the show. And what I found really exciting about the soaring in half whilst we're here was that, so basically I got hold of, I was always obsessed with the soaring in half illusion and I was at the Blackpool Magic Convention, which is a very exciting place to go, uh, especially for me uh, and for all the men there when they say, what's your show about? magicians in Blackpool. They, they love to hear about this show. Not. Um, and, um, and I bought this Soaring in Half uh, illusion from a, a dealer there in Blackpool and um, I just had it in the garage and we, you know we, we, got a, we didn't get quite the grant we were hoping for to make the show and we were struggling financially to, to make the whole thing work and I was like oh what illusion can we do? I was like I'm gonna use that soaring in half. Why am I really using it? What, what's it really got to do with menstruation? It's got nothing to do with menstruation. How can I make it to do with menstruation? And then I came to one of your lectures and uh, you told us the story of the hunter 
Mon Maneki and his wives, and in one of the stories, uh, the woman's body splits in half, and her torso goes up a tree, and her lower half goes into the water, and uh, and and she is wet, and she is menstruating, and then she comes back together again with the help of her mother-in-law. I think is the story, and that is from the South American Tacuna culture, and. Through coming to these lectures, I learned that that could be read as a menstrual story because the woman goes into temporary death and then she comes back together, so she uh, becomes whole again. And across the history of culture, there are these images of, of, of women coming apart and being put together again. And there came the key because all my lecturers at the college, they said, it's all very well you're interested in anthropology, but we want to give you a PhD from the theatre department. What on earth has this got to do with theatre? I was like, it's the soaring in half illusion. This is the pivotal uh, pivot of what my research offers, why I'm not just making a show about other people's research, is because perhaps the soaring in half illusion, perhaps magic itself, if the origins of magic are from groups of menstruating women and groups of menstruating women are the origins of witches, okay, stay with me, then magic, through the witch trials, you know, I read a very interesting book though all about Caliban and the witch, all about uh, feudalism and capitalism and, but that's a whole other story. But um, if, if we um, took magic from the witches and then it found its way into the kind of the magic show run by the male magician sawing the woman in half, what is he doing? He is subjugating and controlling the menstruating female body. He's putting the woman into temporary death and then he is making her be reborn again. And so what can we do to transgress and subvert this and turn it around? How can we take the magic back from, make the magic menstrual? Because um, we're very close right now to the magic circle, a, a men's society, which is just across the road. Uh, they wouldn't appreciate my reading here, but um, perhaps stage magic has been appropriated uh, and particularly these illusions that subjugate and control the female body, that cut it into parts and put it back together, that penetrate it and pierce it and then it becomes whole again. Perhaps all of these images are not just that we're controlling the woman and putting her into bondage and it's all about slavery and power, which it is on some level, but perhaps it's also about menstruation because the main images that we see in magic shows when there is a man and a woman together is images of temporary death and rebirth. So perhaps stage illusion has appropriated menstrual ritual and that's what this is all about. Uh, and that's where I found the reason that my thesis belongs in the theatre department. Um, <laughs> it took a long time to get there. But what we did to appropriate this in this show was um, uh, with Rhiannon's um, complete um, uh, collaboration, uh, Rhiannon, a trans woman, uh, came out showing her body um, and her genitals, which she still has a penis, uh, but she is in transition, and we put her back together and then she comes out of the box, but we make her menstruate as opposed to killing her. Um, that's an image of Fancy Chance hair hanging at the end, covered in menstrual blood. That's an image of Mr. Blue before she puts the sword in her mouth. There's Rhiannon talking about her ritual. Uh, I want to find the image of, um, I'll come back in a minute, of, oh, that's H. We'll find that in a minute. Hang on. I want to find the image of Rhiannon with the blood on her. Oh, well, we'll find that in a minute. As you can see, my slides are not in the right order. Uh, Anyway, perhaps that didn't make it on to there. So we put blood on to Rhiannon. Uh, we give her the gift of menstruation, so that th we, we reverse it. So coming back to this, one of the other things we do is, is we do a kind of fake surgery uh, where we make fancy menstruate. You know, once you take uh, in theatre a theme and play with it, you know, the, um, it's, it's endless. But we took the things that happened. But I'm going to show you some of the rituals that informed the theatre show. Um, and one of the things we do is we, t we I do a kind of funny graph about the outcomes, you know, going back to saying, could we prove that we synchronised? 
and I talk in the show about what happened to the group over this three month period and in fact uh, we did all start to menstrually synchronize five out of seven of us um, two of us got pregnant straight after we did the experiment one of us had a miscarriage somebody had a live birth two people had a cathartic rebirth this is a big funny bit in the show and I'm kind of doing it for you in a bit of a haphazard way uh, we had lucid dreams about snakes and dragons and people being sawn in half um, our bodies changed not, not just through the womb beyond the boundaries of the womb and this is the big ha ha moment shock and confusion to the Sunday dog walkers of South End is off the scale and the formation of an activist movement is also off the scale I'm just going to show you a little bit of of this which is this is some minutes long but this is um so this is Rhiannon. So she used to um, dress in her act when she was a man as a cheerleader. When she was a mime artist, she trained with Gollier in Paris. And she used to do a lot of stuff with balloons. She was a mime artist on the London burlesque and cabaret scene. And we really wanted to kind of take her cabaret personas and put them in the landscape and do something that was cathartic, something that was something almost rebirthing but you know we we were not gonna kind of we were gonna do it in our kind of hip London cabaret outfits as opposed to like wearing clothes from from a culture that we didn't uh, have a heritage in or um, or a kind of you know making a drum circle and kind of just making it up as we went along we decided to make up our pieces out of our identities our experiences and i and i guess as we're watching this because it, it takes a while to, to to happen one of the things we we found when I, I took a lecture about this show to to australia is i'm i'm a white woman from a jewish background um playing an anthropologist and i took the work to australia and i was like oh, i would love to collaborate with an indigenous artist with indigenous heritage ah oh, it'll be great and 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 i met some people from indigenous heritage and i met a woman that represents um indigenous artists to the government and is um, from a, a mixed ind indigenous heritage and she was like well the problem there is is in australia as as a colonized country colonized of white people to of the indigenous people we don't need you to come and represent our culture and i think that what where I got confused and what was interesting about our show here is that I'm coming on as this kind of spoof anthropologist in a way and we're presenting these rituals that are rituals that we made out of the cabaret scene of East London and they mix our identities and our cultural heritages but we're not appropriating anybody else's culture and it's not me putting a lens on someone else's culture and saying hello I'm a white person let's look at all the naked indigenous people and that would be a problem I think and so th we're making a kind of a joke in a way of the idea that we're presenting rituals but we are presenting rituals but these are our rituals because our rituals and our ritual objects are balloons and silver tassels these are our ritual objects these are the things that we have in our landscape and I think the question that would be interesting to open in, in a debate after my, my talk, if I'm not going on too long, is there's a big question going on. I'm just kind of raising this outside of the context of my show as well. But there's a huge big question going on in cabaret at the moment. It's a very, very big controversial area. Cabaret traditionally is exoticizing the other, exoticizing other cultures. And people dress up who are not Japanese pretending to be a geisha and people dress up as an American Indian who aren't American Indians and there's a big question about what that is about and what we're doing as white people when we do that and um, oh, you didn't see that because I didn't turn it up but basically Rhiannon goes into a series of primal screams uh, where's she gone when she does this. So I, I just think that this, okay, we haven't got, I haven't got loud enough sound for you to see that. But if you see the show, it's a very moving moment because uh, she, she goes into a kind of a catharsis and it's her ritual in her costume, in her image that she evolved as an artist. Okay, I think you get where I'm going with this. I'm just trying to kind of open up ideas for a debate afterwards about what it means for me to present myself as an anthropologist and to present ritual and women's rituals 
and these are these are Western women doing Western rituals and then what it meant for me to go to Australia and say oh I'd love to I'd love to collaborate with someone from an indigenous heritage and they're a bit like you know what we can do it without you thanks <laughs> but no thanks <laughs> and so that was you know that was a learning curve is that you know I think there is a big question about cultural appropriation and representation at the moment and you know something that is prime to discuss okay so then uh, fancy made uh, a film of her go on thing these are some of the rituals and for some reason I'm having trouble with that come on oh, go on okay this seems to be stuck I'm just going to do it that way, and I'm going to do it that way, and I'm going to do it that way. Okay, now you can hear the sound. It's a shame we couldn't hear Rhiannon's sound. So, going back to the show, and the rituals that the artists came up with. So, Fancy was really interested in the idea that cosmetics may have originated from menstruating women smearing themselves with, with blood to, to signal that they had finished their menstruation. And that was that she learnt here at, from these lectures. And she came up with this amazing piece of performance. And as you can tell, and prefacing it from before, we looked at a lot of imagery of horror and women in horror and how to kind of turn the idea of the bloodied naked woman around I guess I'm just going to shut up and let you watch this one So I think that that piece, which is really performative and very simple, does, does a lot of things which are quite clever in quite a, a, a minimal and coded way. And that the, the lipstick becomes menstrual, it connects her mouth to her vagina, it becomes like a tampon, but she also becomes clown-like, like a made-up clown. And in the show I make a case that the origins of clowns are menstrual, but I won't go into that just yet. Um, <laughs> And I'm going to show you, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about H and then I'll come back to my, my little bloodbath thing as I did before. Uh, so H did a really interesting thing. So basically I asked all the artists in the group to, to create these menstrual rituals. We, we did it collectively and collaboratively, but we used our own experiences to come up with the material. And um, H decided to collect her menstrual blood uh, and freeze it. 
uh, every month and then she put it into some strawberry jelly and she wanted to make a rabbit out of it exploring myths around the hair and the moon and the image of the rabbit as, uh, as a, a, and the hair around change and the spring and cyclicity and um, these performers do these pieces on the stage but what we did was we made versions of them uh, which have never been seen before in London oh uh, which are new films of them and I don't know how to make it play <coughs> come on no mm -hmm. go on play play sorry This should do it. Okay, we'll go back to it in a minute. So that there is a film of H doing it on Arthur's seat in Edinburgh. But anyway, the great story is is that H made this menstrual blood, this jelly out of menstrual blood, and did this beautiful choreography with her jelly rabbit. And then uh, nine months after the end of the experiment, she gave birth to this baby uh, and had been trying for a while and uh, after doing menstrual rituals, practicing menstrual rituals uh, with a group, following the cyclicity of her body and working with a group and working with performance and ritual, um, she got pregnant and had this baby. And the exciting thing is that if you come and see the show in the autumn, this baby who is now a year older than the last time we did the show is in the show. And her name is Sula. Um, so we took the show to the Edinburgh Festival and um, we wanted to do a kind of communist manifesto, <laughs> Russian constructivist publicity image. And uh, that went down quite well. Um, we were on at two o'clock in the afternoon at the Pleasance, which was a difficult time for the performance. We were on straight after, I think, a, a children's show and just before... <laughs> You know, anyway, so uh, it was interesting, but um, Emma Thompson came and she cried. And uh, we were really, really proud of that. And <laughs> <laughs> we ran after her and said, Emma Thompson! And she was like, oh, I'm very moved. And we got a picture with her, except I haven't shown it to you because it, it's on my Facebook. I look like your weird aunt. I guess if you play Aunt Flo, you end up looking like Aunt Flo. Um, Mister, of course, looks like super glamorous in the picture and like gorgeous. And I'm like, hi, mom. You know, so that was a bit sad. Um, but we did these um, amazing pictures with the red fabric and all the performers and this kind of like onward ho, we will start the revolution with our redness. And uh, we got lots of good reviews. Um, and I, that brings me to the wonderful thing that happened. Uh, we did the show, it was very exciting, but there was an interest, and there is still an interest, uh, to, 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 for it to be more than a show. And people said, well, it's great that you're making these menstrual rituals. Why can't we make menstrual rituals on the dark of the moon? Why don't we do this too? Uh, why does it, if, you know, if those rituals that you've staged are outdoors and in all different locations, can we do that too? I want to show you the one, if I can make it work, of H, which will put this into context for some reason. Go on. Okay, I think that is, the, the ticker is moving. Mm, it's not moving, is it? <sighs> okay, well, another time. Anyway, uh, so she did her piece with the menstrual jelly and, and the hills, in, uh, which connects to this image, but uh, in the hills of Arthur's Seat in Edinburgh. But I'm going to tell you about the menstruals. So the first time we did the show uh, here in the downstairs for the Radical Anthropology Group for International Women's Day 2017, I think we'd done a preview... 2016. So we'd done a preview at the National Theatre Studios and then we did it here. And... Um, there was a kind of a, a feeling from the audience that, you know, why don't we do this idea of, of rituals as activism on the landscape, menstrually themed, anyone could come, bringing that together. So we started to try to, to, to do that. Uh, and Camilla had this fantastic idea that we should run red fabric down the Greenwich Meridian line on Midsummer's Eve. And um, we, 
oh, it was on the dark moon. Greenwich Moon Time. <laughs> and um, we had a, a, small, uh, a small attendance, but it was an important attendance. I don't have the slide here, but we, the police did come <laughs> and move us along. They were two lovely women, weren't they? They were lovely women. And I remember Camilla said, we, they said, who have you got authority from? And you said, we have authority from the moon. <laughs> but they weren't impressed with that. Um, <laughs> About they were that. fairly reasonable. They said, "Finish your your stuff, and then <laughs> and then off you go." Um, and then we decided to kind of join with other uh, women's protests. We joined with the uh, Polish feminists uh, um, when they were protesting against the kind of archaic abortion laws that were being introduced. We joined with the Irish feminists. Uh, we joined with the London Fourth Wave feminists um, on different protests. Obviously, our banner making needs some work. Um, but the idea was that we would be kind of menstrual, menstrual warriors, um, and we're still working on that, and anybody can join. We did um, some really fun things. We, this was from, and you can see that Sula turned up on this march with her mum. This was the Red Riding Hood and the Wolf March that we did around Soho, uh, and you'll see, we have a little film of that in a second, of a wolf that one of the menstruants made. Um, this was another fantastic one where we went to remember the, the match girls and their strike. And we went outside the match factory. I want, you could tell us a little about that. Um, yeah, well, the famous site of the, kind of the, the very first women's and casual trade union uh, from the match girl strike. Um, it, there's this amazing, you have got, you've got a picture of Gladstone statue. I don't have that road. one. Um, because in the road, I can't remember which is the road, Mark, remember, where the statue of Gladstone is outside um, the, um, what, what's it, Bryant and May factory. Um, they still have red paint smeared on that factory, which, or on, that, or on that statue of Gladstone as a kind of, of protest against the uh, parliamentary upper class um, general sort of oppression and, and it. so it, it's extraordinary that there's still a tradition of this, this passing down. So we were, I guess, you know, we were finding as the menstruants, um, you know, um, events and things that we wanted to commemorate, which were about women's solidarity, women's collective action, women's strike, dressed all in red, collectively working together. And this incredible lady, are you here tonight? This lady on the end, she's not here tonight, has her own menstrual blood on her face, I would like to tell you. And I'm sure she would be pleased to tell you that. Um, when I was in Australia, I found some other menstrual activists. This is very pixelated, but these are the menstrual avengers who 10 years ago were uh, in Melbourne, were campaigning against tampon tax. And obviously all over the world, uh, menstrual activism um, is, is, is happening, often around issues uh, of uh, money and tax and women's reproductive rights. And I think that the, 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 the kind of the plight of the menstruants has, has been um, something that we have to still work on because if, if the menstruants are saying, let's celebrate menstruation ritually and use it as a political um, force. Let's, let's look at what it means to have a group of women in red at certain times of the moon appear, appear at certain times of the moon and make uh, intersections into the landscape, but also appear uh, at other demonstrations and marches. Um, we, we want this to grow, it's, it's a big thing to achieve. So if you're interested in being a menstruant, now is the time. We want activists, not clicktivists. <laughs> so joining us on Facebook is not enough. Um, here is a little film of us on the Red Riding Hood march. This was Halloween. So we paraded round Soho, we had some funny chants.
think we do the What's the Time, Mr. Wolf is on here. I'm just waiting for that to happen. There you go. So, um, so what's exciting is that you know it, it, we were inspired in a way by you know the way that say the vagina monologues uh, help bring about this idea of the one billion rising movement. Was that you know how does something that starts off as a fringe theatre show in fringe festivals an obscure little theatre show? How do we take ideas from art and culture, and how do we uh, make that activist? How do we how do we make it more effective, or something that is more affecting to more people than just the performers in the show? And uh, that's, I guess, what we're trying to do. It's very hard to do it, um, but uh, and the menstruants are trying to find their their feet and their identity, and you know how we organise, how we collectivise, what we do, when we do it. I've been trying to finish my PhD, so um, I've stepped back at this moment in time, but anyone wants to step forward. Um, and so what's the future of, 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 of the show? What's the future of the menstruants? Well, the menstruants, as I say, it exists on Facebook. Actions happen. Actions happen sometimes monthly. Sometimes they take a break. Uh, sometimes actions happen um, in, um, in support of, of other uh, demonstrations. Um, the show we're taking out again uh, this autumn. I went to Australia with it and I found, I had a dream, just to get a bit esoteric on you. I had a dream one night that I had this anatomical, funny old body. And then I was there in Melbourne and I saw this thing in the shop the day after. And, uh, and, and I got it from the second hand shop and then I did this, this piece where I take it apart because I show the film of H with her jelly on Arthur's seat that we were unable to make work tonight. Sorry about that. But if you come see the show, you'll see it. And I, I have the jelly inside the womb and then I have it like a Mad Hatter's tea party and uh, get it all over my face. And that worked really well and everyone loved that. Uh, <coughs> or not, because people, uh, of course, are shocked and repulsed by the idea that you could put menstrual blood in your mouth. Our stage manager from Edinburgh Festival has just arrived. This is Sarah. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> and um, so what happens next? Yes, you can next see us here, autumn 2018, at the Attenborough Centre for the Creative Arts in Brighton. We are redeveloping this summer. Um, we won't have all the cast every time. It's very hard to keep a theatre company together. People go all over and their, their lives change, their careers change. It's hard to keep a theatre company together over a five year period of the show. But we have different performers on different nights during the tour. We're going to Lancaster, Bristol, uh, lots of places, Colchester, Norwich. Uh, we're popular in the East sector region for some reason and uh, catch us and then hopefully back to Soho Theatre just waiting for that final confirmation for two weeks in November. Um, come and see the show, join the Menstronauts on Facebook and become a Menstronaut and figure out with us what menstrual activism, menstrual spiritualism and menstrual performance do when they come together. Thank you very much. <laughs>